Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. I'm Natalia Moczulska and this is the news. The Polish Sejm will hold its first session on November 13th. According to President Duda's nominee for senior marshal, Marek Savicki, the new speaker could convene a session of the lower house of parliament after a week and order a vote of constructive no confidence in Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. According to experts, this is an unconstitutional action. According to a declaration by the Civic Coalition, the third way and the left, the three groups will form a parliamentary majority with 248 deputies. This would allow the opposition to try through voting to remove law and justice from power. This would involve disregarding the provisions of the Constitution. If Mr. Morawiecki has already submitted the resignation of the current government, whether to me as senior marshal or to the newly elected marshal of the same, and gets called on by the president, then according to what constitutionalists tell me, the new marshal within seven days can convene a session of the same with one item on the agenda, a constructive vote of no confidence in the government of Mateusz Morawiecki. Such a vote could take place as soon as a week after the same meeting, that is on November 20th. I would resign if I was in Mr. Prime Minister's shoes. I would not invite anyone to join the government, due to the fact that I think the Prime Minister will not be able to form a government from the people he has. But if I had to, I would definitely invite not politicians, but experts. If the variant proposed by Marek Savitsky were to be implemented, the new government could be deprived of proper legitimacy, says constitutionalist Professor Richard Piotrowski. Passing a constructive vote of no confidence in a government that is in the process of obtaining a vote of confidence is unconstitutional. <inaudible> President Andrzej Duda signed the order to convene the first session of the same in Senate on November 13th. Marek Savitsky will become the senior speaker of the same. In the Senate, this function will be held by Michał Severinsky of Law and Justice. After calm analysis and consultations, I have decided to entrust the mission of forming a government to Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. According to the Constitution, the president appoints the government within 14 days of the first session of the same. After two weeks, that is from November 27th, the head of the new government has another 14 days to deliver an expose and receive a vote of confidence from the lower house of parliament. If the parliament does not support the prime minister, then the initiative for selecting the prime minister will be taken by the parliament. The announcement of the appointment of Mr. Morawiecki as prime minister is already rather indicative of the fact that the president is already calculating his political future. According to the provisions of the constitution, the united right government can remain in power for one more month, which means until December 11th. This does not please the opposition, which would like to come to power as soon as possible. The term of the head of the financial supervisory commission ends at the end of November, so the choice of a successor will depend on the prime minister. Should the opposition decide to fast-track a vote of no confidence in Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki and elect Donald Tusk to the post, President Andrzej Duda could petition the Constitutional Court to examine the constitutionality of such an action. A constructive vote of no confidence, at least without this first step by the president, is a violation of the Constitution, meaning that the election of such a prime minister will be unconstitutional. According to unofficial information, the position of the marshal of the same will be rotated if three groups from the existing opposition take power. Shimon Hovnia would become the marshal of the same, followed by the left candidate. On the other hand, there are to be five deputy marshals of the same. Two positions will go to the civic coalition, and one position each will be given to representatives of the Third Way, the New Left and Law and Justice. Meanwhile, the Confederation will have no representative in the post. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has declared that the Israeli military has encircled Gaza City and is operating within its borders. Moreover, Netanyahu announced that there will be no ceasefire with Hamas, nor will there be a resumption of fuel deliveries to Gaza unless the militants release all hostages. At the same time, he again appealed to Palestinians to move to the south of the Gaza Strip. If Hezbollah decides to join the war, it will make a grave mistake. There will be no ceasefire without the release of our hostages. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, at a press conference after a meeting of G7 foreign ministers in Tokyo, said that a transition period for post-conflict governance in Gaza is possible, but Israel cannot occupy Gaza. The G7 countries said in a joint statement that Israel has the right to self-defense, while stressing the need to protect civilians and comply with international humanitarian law.
More Palestinians are fleeing to the southern Gaza Strip, reported the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Yesterday, 15,000 civilians crossed into the south, three times as many as in the previous day. More than 10,000 Palestinians have been killed and 25,000 wounded since retaliation began for an attack carried out by Hamas on October 7th, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. Israeli authorities say the Hamas terrorist actions have led to at least 1,400 deaths and 5,400 wounded. We had in-depth discussions about the steps that we are taking to address urgent needs on the ground. Uh, we all agreed that humanitarian pauses would advance key objectives to protect Palestinian civilians, to increase the sustained flow of humanitarian assistance, to allow our citizens and foreign nationals to exit, and to facilitate the release of hostages. The States believes key elements should include no forcible displacement of Palestinians uh, from Gaza. Not now, not after the war. When it comes to post-conflict uh, governance in Gaza, um, a few things are, are clear and necessary. One. Uh, Gaza cannot be con uh, continue to be run by Hamas. Um, uh, that simply invites a repetition of October 7th, uh, and Gaza uses a place from which to launch terrorist attacks. Uh, it's also clear that... The European Commission has recommended opening accession negotiations with Ukraine. Ursula von der Leyen reported on the status of Ukraine's preparations for EU membership. In turn, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky welcomed the European Commission's decision. Ukraine has completed, I was there over the weekend and um, could convince myself, well over 90 percent of the necessary steps that we set out last year in our report. Just to give you an idea, main progress has been achieved on the constitutional justice reform, on the selection of the High Council of Justice, the anti-corruption program, progress on anti-money laundering, important measures to curb the oligarch's grip on the public life, new media law, and progress on national minorities. And on this basis, we have recommended today that the Council opens accession negotiations. We also recommend that the Council adopts a negotiating framework once Ukraine has carried out the ongoing reforms. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky described the European Commission's recommendation as the right step in history. This is a pure positive. Despite all the difficulties, we are moving forward. Already in December, we expect a political decision from the European Council. Ukrainians have always been and remain part of our common European family. Our country must be in the European Union. Ukrainians deserve it both for their defense of European values and for the fact that even in times of full-scale war, we keep our word and develop state institutions. All the necessary decisions are being adopted. EU leaders are expected to decide on whether to accept the Commission's recommendation at a summit in December. The recommendation is an important milestone on Ukraine's road to Western integration and a geopolitical gambit for the EU, as Ukraine has been fighting against a large-scale Russian invasion since February of 2022. In the end, um, some kind of settlement will have to be found before the country can join. The tricky thing is how to ensure that there is a settlement without giving Putin veto power over Ukraine's European accession. I myself think it's rather important that the EU doesn't set as a precondition anything that could become something that's controlled by Moscow. You want uh, to set as preconditions for accession things that are controlled from Kiev, not from Moscow. The European Commission made a similar recommendation for Moldova, Ukraine's neighbor. It also said Georgia should receive the status of a membership candidate once it meets certain conditions. Additionally, it said the EU should begin membership talks with Bosnia and Herzegovina once the necessary degree of compliance with the membership criteria is achieved. Widespread flooding in Kenya and Somalia has killed dozens of people and forced tens of thousands to leave their homes. This is the worst flooding in decades. Food and drink water are beginning to run out for those who fled their homes. Somalia's government has declared a state of natural disaster following torrential downpours that killed at least 29 people. The element destroyed homes, roads and bridges. Rescuers are trying to reach several thousand people cut off by water. 
According to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, floods have forced the evacuation of more than 113,000 people. The heavy rains that swept through Somalia came after a four-year drought. In neighboring Kenya, the country's Red Cross reported that at least 15 people have already died since Friday when the downpours began. The port city of Mombasa and areas in the northeast are most at risk. By Sunday, floods had destroyed 1,000 hectares of crops. Kenya's meteorological service warned as early as September that this year's rainy season, which runs from October to December, could bring unusually heavy rainfall. But President William Ruto assured citizens that the forecast had been withdrawn and no flooding was expected. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please stay tuned for Poland Daily Weather, Poland Daily Business, and some of our other programs. But for me, it's have a wonderful evening.